Hello and welcome to The Last Word on Spurs. We hope you're keeping very, very safe and well. Thank you so much for joining us as always on this show. Again, another big Last Word on Spurs in store for you. If you're listening to the show for the first time and where have you been for the last five, six, seven, eight years, you can find us on iTunes or on Spotify or across all major audio platforms. We're, of course, on Twitter at Last Word on Spurs or on Facebook and Instagram too. And, of course, already for a building audience here on YouTube, we're delighted to be welcoming a very special guest back on The Last Word on Spurs. And talk about timing. I always say when you ever try and bring shows together of a certain nature, there always seems to be news breaking in relation to the context of that show in the build-up to it. So if we're very lucky, or we just seem to know what we're doing, I'll probably go with the first one rather than the second one. We don't really know what we're doing on last one on Spurs. But joining me as always, got my wonderful co-host in the house, the brilliant Lee McQueen. Lee, lovely to be back on last one on Spurs, mate. How are you? Yeah, really well, Rick, and uh, really excited to have Kieran back on with us as well tonight to talk all things football finance. But I've got to get my uh, He's the Reason in, a bit of uh, Rodrigo Benton Kerr t-shirt on. So uh, shout out to uh, to Tim uh, and to uh, at Spurs Song Sheets and of course at Digital Spurs as well for making it happen. But uh, yeah, he is the reason why we're playing on Wednesdays next season um, as the song goes. And I'll be really interested to get into the financial side of the Champions League and all everything else with, uh, with the wonderful Kieran Maguire that we've got with us. Yeah, absolutely superb. Listen, um, delighted to bring this man back on. I think it's fair to say, I don't want to think this border on harassment, but I was saying to Kieran, Kieran, can we try and get you back on? I was trying to get the diaries, hey, what can we do? What can we do? And Kieran gladly obliged. I think at the point of just saying, just just leave me alone. I'll, I'll, I'll come on the show, but just leave me alone for another seven or eight months. The brilliant Kieran Maguire joins the last one on Spurs. Kieran, thank you so much for your time. Love to be back on the show. How are you? Well, I'm Grant. Thanks. Thanks very much for the invite, guys. And it's an absolute delight to be talking about something other than Derby County, which which has effectively taken over my life life uh, for the last nine months since that club went into administration. And and that that's an, an example of a club which isn't run very well. And that's something I won't be saying in respect to Spurs. You know, Spurs, are, in my view, are right at the other end of the spectrum. Superb. Well, Kieran, listen, we're very lucky to have you on this show because, again, uh, the financial aspects of Spurs, because of the nature that we do a couple of shows a week, uh, we don't always get the chance to delve into kind of key specific uh, topics like tonight where we look and really analyse the financial side of the football club over the course of the last 12 months, all the building topics. And we know, obviously, just to com- just to confirm and not everyone uh, be calm about it, obviously, we know Ali Gold's just done a recent video um, where it's just been released where Ali suggests that Spurs may very well be, and that's Enoch, open to a sale over the course of the next 12 months. So we will cover that aspect with Kieran and so much more here on The Last Word on Spurs. So thank you thank, thank you so much already for joining us. Um, what I must say, as always, as you guys know by now, that we're absolutely delighted to be sponsored by the Beaver Town Corner Pin. That's the Beaver Town bang opposite the South Stand. And no doubt we've hopefully got some content coming your way very soon during pre-season, ahead of the new season. And they've actually got an exclusive offer on right now for you, lovely bunch. So if you head over to beavertown.co.uk and use that code TOP4, and yes, TOP4, all in capitals, all one word, four, by the way, you can bag yourself 15% off all their beer on their website for a limited time. Terms and conditions apply. And listen, McQueen, we know he likes the old laser crush. We know he does like going for a bit more of the harder stuff as the season is going to prepare to really get going. So make sure you check them out, www.beavertownbrewery.co.uk. Right, Kieran, just for new listeners, new viewers that we're getting all the time, and we're so humbled for that on last one on Spurs, you just want to give us a bit of a background as to what you cover in the world of football? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach football finance at university. I know some people who say, hold on, that's not a proper subject. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to try and keep it as a quasi-proper subject to convince my boss that it's real for the for the next five or six years. Um, uh, so I've, I've been, been involved in football finance probably since the Glazers took over Manchester United because when that story broke, it, it was a first. People didn't really understand what was happening on happening in respect of it and, and I and I got wheeled on uh by the BBC to talk about it and, and the way that it works with with the Beeb is so long as you don't muck up they tend to ask you back and now uh I'm doing between six and seven hundred interviews a year for TV radio uh you know newspapers and so on and, and you know it's nice to be invited onto podcasts for individual clubs so I keep I keep a record of every single club in England and Scotland uh and, and some of the European clubs as well and I'm, I'm just a bit of a nerd who who, who, who for, for no no particular reason, uh, b- because I'm obsessed with the subject. And I think fans are, are now becoming more aware 
of football finance as being uh, an issue because FFP, because of Super League, because of Project Big Picture, the new owners at Newcastle and so on, that they're, uh, uh, they, they tend to ping a few questions. Superb. Well, listen, Kieran, whenever we've had you on last spot on Spurs, and I merely have thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, delighted to have you back once again. It's always great shows, always in real detail, context about the football side of the financial side of the football club, which we always enjoy. Um, I promise we are going to come on to, obviously, Ali's recent, um, well, remark in his video in regards to the actual the ownership side, the sales side. But I think what we want to start off with, Kieran, is just essentially that we're on the 24th of May. Um, Tottenham Hotspur announced that owners Enoch would pump 150 million cash is in terms of an injection into the football club as they look to really challenge under Antonio Conte in the upcoming season, which is winging its way to us very, very fast here. Really interested to know your thinking behind the timing of the announcement and whether you felt it was a good move for Enoch and Daniel Levy to go public on that announcement. I felt it was an, an intriguing announcement because football clubs and you know corporate entities, it, it, as a rule, don't tend to make a big fuss about things. So I think the first reaction, and this was the reaction, I think, of, of part of the Spurs fan base, was that this was not just sending out a message to the fans. This was also sending out a message to the manager that there would be resources available uh, potentially over the course of the summer. Uh, because you know Antonio Conte had been a bit ambivalent with regards to his commitments with uh, you know, in terms of the club over the, the course of the summer. Now, uh, a couple of days ago um, on on Company's House, which is where uh, all companies have to go and submit all all their filings, um, the first one hundred million pounds of that potential one hundred and fifty was uh, was lodged. So, what has happened is that uh, shareholders. Have uh, have injected a hundred million pounds into the club, and, and that's first of all that that's a positive from an FFP point of view because you're because under FFP you're only allowed to lose fifteen million pounds over three years, but you can top that up to a hundred and five by by shareholders investing in the club. So 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 that's uh, that that was a positive from an FFP point of view. Although having done my own calculations, I, I think Spurs I've got loads and loads of headroom. As far as FFP are concerned, um, although they made a, a big loss in the accounts last season, uh, a lot of a lot of the costs were, were exempt from FFP, and they actually made an FFP profit. Superb! I think that's a good start, Lee. Over to you, mate. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, really, because an ink obviously we'll know, but the backstory is owned by eighty-five-year-old Joe Lewis, Uncle Joe, as as we like to call him uh, sometimes in these parts. He's worth, according to latest Forbes figures, around, you know, just a little 4.3 billion. Uh, he's agreed a capital increase, if you just mentioned there, of up to 150 million with, with Tottenham uh, via issue of convertible A shares and accompanying warrants. Um, the club announced that the equity injection provides the Premier League club with greater financial flexibility and the ability to further invest on and off the pitch. I know there's probably Twitter's in meltdown now because it's off the pitch. Like, oh, they're going to buy, build a new hotel or whatever it is. But we, as you've just mentioned there, Kim, we know that that's been uh, kind of uh, almost drawn down now and ready to, let's let's hope to, to go and spend on some players. Um, they've been judged to some degree, uh, th th this, this ownership really, over the last kind of 20 years on the lack of silverware with only one trophy um, in the last 20 years, despite building new training ground, new stadium, infrastructure, the world-class um, infrastructure we've now uh, uh, built. Kieran, in your opinion, how have they run Tottenham Hotspur, I suppose, as a business? I mean, you mentioned uh, right at the beginning of the show, you know, you, Derby's not been well run, but you won't be saying that about Spurs. So do, do, do you think, Kieran, that as a business, Tottenham have been run tip-top? Well, I, I've, I've, got, I've got the records for every single club that's been in the Premier League since 1992, uh, every single set of accounts. And Spurs are not just the most profitable club in the history of the Premier League, but they are the most profitable club by by a fair distance. So wow. um, I, I, I'll, I'll probably disappear sort of halfway in the sense that I've got my spreadsheets uh, just behind this screen. But, but Spurs have made over £400 million pounds worth of profit. Um, I, I think in terms of strategy, um, in my view, they, they they have a master plan in the sense that uh, they realise in order to compete 
with clubs that are bigger brands. And, and I know it's, it's a horrible word to use because we're football fans first and foremost, but uh, the brand of Spurs is not as big as that of Manchester United, is not as big as that as Liverpool. I know you want, don't want me to say it's probably not as big as Chelsea. You know, I, 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 have the, the, I have the fortune to, to, to travel all, all around the world teaching and yeah, ju- judging by a very crude measure of what football shirts do I see, um, you know, th- those are the three big ones. Manchester City are, are way back. Um, what we are seeing, I think, is Spurs are, uh, are catching up and, and if not overtaking Arsenal and yeah, you know, I know you don't want to hear it. You know, Arsenal have won more trophies, but but they've not won trophies for a while. So um, I, th- I think the strategy of the club was therefore to invest in infrastructure to keep a really tight lid uh, as far as wages were concerned. And when the the infrastructure benefits started to come through, so potentially uh, now you know Spurs with being in the Champions League, they have the capacity to be the biggest revenue earners from match day income. Uh, in in the country, uh, and, and that's come from a long way behind. Because at at White Hart Lane, uh, Spurs were probably getting somewhere in the region of thirty five to forty million pounds a year from ticket sales. Manchester United, hundred and ten. Arsenal. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm old enough to remember when Arsenal used to qualify for the Champions League. Um, and <laughs> nice, you uh, can come back any time. <laughs> I thought, I thought, thought yeah, I, I played for the gallery. Um, <laughs> Arsenal had the capacity to generate, again, around about 110 million. Based on my calculations, I think Spurs can go 120 uh, wow. you know, if, if they have a decent run. So, so, so that that is very promising. Um, the f- fact that they have future-proof the stadium, it's a multifunction stadium. All of these things are, you know, this, this isn't the reason why you fell in love with Spurs, but it, it is giving Spurs the the raw resources which can then be reinvested uh in terms of uh yeah decisions which are being made on the pitch the ability not just to to sign players but to renegotiate contracts from those players that you don't want to leave so uh financially that they have been run on on a on a really tight budget i can understand the frustration from a fan's perspective but you, you've got a sustainable club on the back of that. And also, had it not been run that that way for so many years, the ability to move and fund the new stadium simply wouldn't have existed because the banks, before they lend, that they 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 do a credit check. They they look at the risk involved. You know, just like if you or you or I apply for a credit card, if 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 we if we've been down the nightclubs, you know, five nights a week, and it, you know, and, and uh, if we're maxed out on every every other. Uh, uh, set of borrowings, then then the banks won't touch it. And the, and the fact that we've got some pretty senior investment banks, not only willing to lend money to Spurs, but willing to lend money to Spurs at a very low interest rate. You know, we're talking about you know two and a half, three and a half percent. When when the Glazers took over Manchester United, Manchester United ended up paying interest at sixteen percent because they they were that nervous. The lenders. Wow. So I, I think as 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 a business. Um, there's a lot of positives uh, in in respect of Spurs, and sometimes you've got to to do your background work. You've got to build up your infrastructure to be in a position to to then hopefully uh, be in a position to spend more money on on what you want to see, which is of course the success on the pitch. Yeah, I mean, again, fascinating, fascinating stuff. stuff. Really, really is, isn't it? Always great. Always fantastic. Um, I mean, the interesting thing here, Kieran, coming back around to you, of course, is the additional funds in combination with revenue from a first full season at the new stadium, full capacity, comes on the back of Spurs returning to the Champions League after two years away. I'm interested to know your thoughts from an outsider if you think the club, had they failed to make the Champions League, would we have seen this level of investment potentially? Or do you think it's down to the fact Conte's come in, the club have achieved Champions League, he's now getting that back in? Um, I, I think we we, would, we still may have seen the capital injection from Enoch had the club failed to, to make the Champions League, simply because, again, what they're trying to do is to uh, persuade Conte to, to have faith in the club. Uh, and uh, on on the back of that, they they were showing their their indication of investment. Um, you know, he he is on a very lucrative contract. 
um, as as far as Premier League managers are concerned. So that's going to that would have made it difficult for him to have gone to many other places. Uh, but they, you know, they, you know, let's be honest. You know, I I lived forty years in Manchester. There was a lot of talk in Manchester about if Conte is not happy there. Well, we'll go and say hello to him. But you know that that's now been dealt with, um, and, and Spurs Spurs are in the Champions League. The benefit of the Champions League is that for every one pound that you make in the Europa League, you make five in in the Champions League. So a good run in the Champions wow. League but potentially is going to bring you you know twenty twenty two million pounds worth of of prize money. Um, you can make a hundred and ten million by winning the Champions League. And on top of that, of course, you've got, uh, yeah, what, six, seven home matches at Spurs uh, you know, at, at the new stadium. Now the club has the capacity to make four, four and a half million quite easily uh, in terms of match day. Uh, you know, the catering incomes estimated to be around about £800,000 per match, uh, you know, because the, and as an away fan, what I've seen is it, it's one of those grounds where, you you might arrive a little bit earlier and stay a bit a little bit later. Yeah, and you you think about you think about a football club as a business. It's only open twenty five days a year. But yeah, you know, sort of you know league, league and cup matches on a, on sort of a normal season. Um, if you go to Old Trafford, I don't know whether the last time you've been to Old Trafford, it, it's a bit of a dump. So therefore, you you know, okay, you might have a photograph taken outside if you're that way inclined, and I'm not. But as as an away fan, you, I'd get there at. 20 to three because the seats are too small. You know, I'm, I'm six foot three. I, I can't, I can't sit down even if I wanted to. Uh, the, the seats are terrible. The catering facilities are poor. There, there is nothing, there is nothing to make you want to get there early or stay for a couple of drinks afterwards. Now what Spurs have done and, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm a Brighton fan, but you know, I'll, I'll be honest here. What we, what we've done this season is exactly the same. Big concourses, lots of, uh, lots of variety of food, and and people will go inside and don't rip off the fans when they get inside either. So so you know and if, if if people are staying for an extra pint before and a pie afterwards, you multiply that by if we can get twenty thirty thousand people doing that for every home match, then the numbers start to rack up. So I, I, it, it's it's an impressive uh, business model that the club has, which is it is aimed and it's a horrible word. This it's aimed at monetizing the fan base. Yes. It's, it's interesting, actually, Kieran, you say that because that's that's exactly what happens. Like on a match day, like we we go to most home, or well, I go to every home game, um, yeah. and you know the you know, there's two hours. The stadium opens two hours before kickoff. Um, it closes about two hours after, and and you get emails about that all of the time to make sure that everybody knows that that is what's happening, so mm-hmm. that they can maximise, like you say. Um, all that revenue. There was loads of questions coming in. How much match day revenue? How much match day revenue? So just to clarify, so about, would you think it's about four and a half, five million uh, each match day that we could we could probably gross in? If, I think if you combine that with the with match day merchandise sales, match day catering income, yeah, there, there's no reason why it, why it can't be. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly of the view that I'm looking forward to seeing Spurs' next set of accounts because mm. that will effectively give us a benchmark. And remember, that was in a non-Champions League season. So there is yeah. capacity to go further as far as um, you know, 22, 23 is concerned. Now, you know, this is something which you'll know that I won't know. You know were, were the prices cut, for example, for some of the group games in, in, the, in the non-Champions League competitions <laughs> because you know, the view of the club was, Let's get let's get them there. You know, yeah. an, an empty an empty seat is 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 a, z- a it's a zero for the seat and b it's a zero for pie and pint sales. So yeah, um, exactly. I, I in the Champions League where you're going to be one of the top two seeds, so therefore you know you're going to have another big seed in that group. The the, the, hospi- the hospitality, the the uh, uh, you know the the team which is involved in in selling the boxes will be able to charge premium prices. Which, which you can't do with with no disrespect if, if you're playing the you know the, the fourth best team in Denmark on a Thursday night. Totally. And and and, yeah. and again, you know, just from my own experiences uh, through through my through my business and for the corporate stuff that we do, um, you know, it's miles more exciting to go to a Champions League match with uh, take clients to a Champions League game than it is to like you say to to play a home game against the fourth tier 
in Denmark, it's just not it's just not as lucrative for sure. So again, it's absolutely fascinating stuff um, that, that that we're getting to tonight. And I just, I just want to um, go back to kind of Daniel Levy as well. I mean, you know, he he did come out and say quite openly from very early on, but also quite recently as well that the delivery of a world class home was always a key building block in driving diversified revenues to enable us to invest in the teams and support our ambitions to be consistently competing at the highest level of European football, which you could argue, you know, that's where we are now. You know, we're, you know, we're not consistently there right now, but we got back into the, the door, if you like, the front door is open for us to walk through back to the Champions League. You know, that additional capital from Anink will now enable further investment in the club at a really, really important time. So, What's your opinion on Daniel Levy, Kieran? Do you think he deserves... Uh, Spurs fans are going to be split when I say this, but do you think he deserves more credit as he's known? Um, because he's been kind of labelled as a tough negotiator and, you know, uh, we don't, you know, we went, what, 318 days without even making a sign-in. So, you know, we've gone through some some barren and tough times, not just from trophies, because they're still here, but also through signing players and spending money and that type of stuff. But do you ultimately think that Daniel Levy should be given a little bit more credit to actually now where we're seeing? I mean, just to, before, I, sorry, I will let you answer in a second, but there's so many comments saying, we're so excited about this transfer window. It's the, it's the, the most that I've ever been excited. We're feeling that. I know Rick and I talk all the time and the rest of our WhatsApp group are feeling that and all this sort of stuff. So do you think that now is... It's always been building to this point and is now the point where we should be giving Daniel Levy and, and, and his team a bit more credit. As a football fan, it's very difficult to be patient. And it, it doesn't matter <laughs> oh, man, which, that. which team you're talking about. So I, I've been on some Newcastle podcasts and you, know, it, it, you can imagine how giddy they are uh, after 14 years of, of Mike Ashley. And, and, and I've said... Yeah, the the paradox about Mike Ashley at uh, at Newcastle United is that he left the club with a, with a one hundred and ten million pound FFP profit, which means that the new owners can can go, yeah, they can spend whatever they, they want. Go, yeah. Um. So so um, D Daniel Levy deserves credit for delivering on the stadium. Um. He. He, he deserves credit for putting together a financial package in respect of that stadium, which is is very beneficial for the club. So, again, based on my calculations, the, the interest cost uh, in respect of uh, an annual year at Spurs, interest cost probably be in the region of £25 million, but the stadium itself will generate... 70 75 million of, of additional revenue so so you know the, the net uh the net benefits to the club uh in its ability to go forwards are substantial spurs are still some way behind uh some of the other clubs in the premier league when it comes to commercial operations um and that's not a criticism necessarily of the board we, we all know where we are in the pecking order yeah we might not want to admit it but we all secretly know, you know, it's Manchester United and Liverpool. They, you know, you've only got to look at the websites. You've only got to look at the newspapers. Uh, you know, they, they get an awful lot more attention. So Spurs are now fighting for that set, that that second tier, you know, of of the of the top six clubs. Arsenal, if if I'm honest, Arsenal have dropped dropped by the wayside, and that's not, and, I, and I'm here. I'm not I'm not not playing to the gallery on this one. Yeah, it's it's an honest observation. Uh, Arsenal are the only football club in the history of the Premier League, whose wage bill has gone down over three, over three years. So, you know, it's, it's the first time I've ever seen it happen because, you know, the nature of football and wages is it tends to drive things up. So, so Arsenal are in a bit of a pickle, which means they, 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 they needed to get into the Champions League probably more than Spurs did this season. And it was a much bigger blow for them, in, in my view. So it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen in respect of that. Um, Daniel Levy is has has run Spurs as a fan who is a businessman, but he's run it from a businessman's perspective first and foremost. And he's always had his long term vision. It's been difficult to buy into that vision from a fan's perspective when you see other clubs going out and spending money left, right, and centre, window after window. When you see that Spurs are only spending you know 39 pence in every pound uh is going in wages when you've got other clubs at 60s and 70s as as has happened under Daniel Levy 
in, in some of those years. But that 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 profit that was made, it, it hasn't been frittered away. It, it's not been paid out in dividends to shareholders thinking about a, a certain club in Manchester where where the fan base is completely disengaged and disaffected. So um, if that money is A, reinvested and B, reinvested well, um, and, and, and that's another important factor. Uh, if we take a look at Everton, uh, the, the new Everton owner came in in 2016. He spent £568 million in five years. Can you name a single really? You know, R R Richarlison is good when he's not diving on the ground and when he can be bothered. You know, and, and you know, uh, See, the irony he could be an, he could be a Spurs summer signing. Yeah, he's, he's, he's good now. Yeah. He's good now. We we love the diving now. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's true, isn't it? Five five hundred six eight million. What's that? Like best part of one hundred and ten million or whatever it is over over them five years. And what have they actually got to show for it? Uh, they got players that they've let back out on loan. At like Moyes Keen, for example, is one of the big. Uh, these top my head. Was it Tozan or something that Check Tozan, million, yeah, went back twenty five mil. Yeah, was, um, you know they they took Gilfie Alan, Alan as well was a, was quite yeah, a big fee. Alan Gilfie was yeah. fifty million, and then obviously yeah. he's had his personal issues and all of the yeah. issues that he's had around that. I mean, they've had a shock, haven't they? To be fair, mm. yeah. So so there, there is a difference between spending it and spending it well, and um, it'll be interesting to see what the Spurs strategy is. Because uh, yeah, because I'm involved in sort of the business side of the game, and what we are seeing from more and more clubs is a more data driven approach. Manchester City's uh, Manchester City have, have uh, recruited an astrophysicist from from Harvard University wow. to be involved in their data analytics side. Because if you get it wrong, it's it's a big big mistake, and it can be very very expensive mistakes. And because of the nature of footballers' contracts these days, it, it's it, it, it's left a bit like a fart in, in a in a lift in the fact that you know it, it lingers for far too long, um, and and you can't get rid of the players because they're on big money. So you look at, uh, sorry, Kim, just to interject, you look at Tungan Dembele. I mean, our recruitment has been shocking over the last two three years for five hundred eighty days without making any signings at all, and then when we did make the signings, they've been awful. I mean, the so we may get. 50, maybe 60% of the feedback that we paid for him, if we're lucky. Tunga and Dembele, we're lucky to, you know, just write off his contract. I think half of that 150 million injection will probably go and pay Tunga and Dembele's contract off. Because he, he's, he's on a contract of 62 million to him, 200 grand a week, six year, five year, six year deal, I think it was. Uh, plus the, the, the actual fee that we paid for him. So you, you are, you're spot on. It's, it's, it is astronomically hurting. Uh, not football clubs, by the way. I see it all the time in the line of work that I'm in. My, my tech business is an assessment platform around uh, getting the, the right hires for your business. Because if you get it wrong, it costs you absolute thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. Obviously, in football, it's millions and millions of pounds. So very, very um, interesting stuff. And just want to quickly um, uh, say, just following on the rest of that statement, Daniel Levy went on to say at the time, the investment represents permanent capital with non-ongoing interest cost to the club. Uh, which may be drawn in tranches until the end of the year. The club's independent directors have benefited from its majority shareholders' ability to invest directly, swiftly, and without the extensive due diligence and documentation involved in third-party funding, all of which obviously is very, very positive. Under the agreed structure that A shares can be converted into ordinary shares, the number of ordinary shares granted to an inc as a result of the capital increase will vary depending on when the A ordinary shares uh, are converted, when the warrants are exercised, and obviously the valuations at the time. If drawn in four and based on assumptions, a Inc has always been the largest shareholder of Tottenham since 2001, and stock divided will increase its ownership club from around 85.6% to around 87.5%. So what's that, you know, digit basically, upon conversion. Uh, when 150 million capital increase was announced, Spurs' statement explained the Inink's ownership share of the club would increase if the full amount was used. Um, and it went on to say any dilutive impact is dependent on the number of shares granted and will be shared by all shareholders proportionally and principally by Inink, the majority shareholder. In the grand scheme of things, does the minimal percentage of the ownership change anything Kieran so it's a massive mouthful but obviously that was the actual formal statement so does it change anything in your view um not not really if, if I was a minority shareholder in Spurs I'd I'd a welcome 
uh, the additional funds because potentially if, if you are looking for some form of an exit route from the club, you want it to be playing in the Champions League. You want it to be attracting attention from realistically where the, the, the most probable market for new football ownership is, and, and that is in the United States. Um, and, and they, that, that, it, you know, the nature of America is that they like winners. So uh, what's holding Spurs back uh, is that they ain't been winners, you know, and, and, and we therefore, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that, and that's something which, which can be addressed, but it's, you know, it, it's the same as any form of investment yet. The investment comes first and the rewards come second. And, and uh, I, I think for a long period of time, the, the invest, there's, there's, there's what, I, what I sometimes when I'm talking sort of teaching perspective, there's, there's two types of investment. There's what you might call maintenance investment, where as one, one thing goes, you replace it with something similar. So that's what Spurs have done uh, in, in respect of historically, they sold players, they spent that money to, to, to sort of plug those gaps. And then there is enhancement or expansion expenditure. And I think Spurs with the stadium are now in a position where they can go for enhancement expenditure, but it's, but it's got to be done well. Um, it, as, as far as Enoch are concerned, they, they were the majority shareholder, Lee, as you said, they, they are still, they were in charge of the business. They're still in charge of the business. Um, they will have the last word on Spurs. Yeah, nice, love that. Just quickly, maybe it's it's worth because there has been um, in Ali Gold, friend of the show, obviously he's mentioned in his, his recent video, as as uh, Rick said. Is there? What's your view, Kieran? Just quickly on maybe the valuation of the club or or the ability to be able to sell the club. Um, do, do you think that? And this is me just speculating. Actually, do do you think that because now an ink have seen Chelsea just been sold basically to Todd Bowley's consortium up was it four billion or four and a half billion that there, there is an opportunity you know there's there's buyers out there essentially do, do you think that 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 may happen in the next 12 months um if, if I was Daniel Levy or Enoch I wouldn't be wanting to sell Spurs in the next 12 months because um you're absolutely right Lee we, we, Chelsea have sent have set a benchmark in terms of club valuation. Um, and, and that benchmark is significantly higher than than expectations. Remember, it was only eight months ago that, that Newcastle United went for 300 million. And Three, Newcastle yeah. have got, oh, yeah, what, a 52,000 capacity stadium. They, they've got, they had no, they effectively had no debt or they had no external debt. They were run on a profitable basis. Um, I, I'd done some crunching of numbers in respect of Chelsea. And, and I reckon Chelsea was worth around about one and a half billion because uh, the, the reason why Chelsea won trophies was simply this. Roman Abramovich put £900,000 a week of his own money into that club for 19 years. And that and that changes everything. Um, and Chelsea have the biggest wage bill in the history of the Premier League. They have the hit that they have the highest transfer spend in the history in the history of the Premier League. They they have the highest uh, transfer receipts in the history of the Premier League. So, but they but they didn't have the highest amount of income. They're way way behind because they've got a forty one thousand capacity stadium. So Abramovich didn't just plug that gap. He went far beyond that, and, and that allowed them to be successful. I think in respect of what's happening for Spurs is that they are using the stadium as a means of narrowing the gap with some of the other clubs um, and going slightly ahead. They still need to work on commercial. And you know, I think you know, naming rights of the stadium is one of the issues you want to talk about. Um, you know, that, that, will be, that will be a consideration. And that's certainly why the club has been very reluctant for anybody to describe what I call White Hart Lane, a White Hart Lane. Because to me, okay. it's it's the same place as before. Hundred percent, yeah. yeah. And to us, it is as well. So to yeah. answer that question, Kieran, just full context for you, you wouldn't understand the potential sale of the club in the next twelve months. Um, I think many look at it as like it, it could be at its peak value when you consider, obviously, club in the Champions League, got world class manager Antonio Conte, got the stadium, got the training ground. Do you think there's more still that once they, you'd imagine if they nail a stadium naming right still for a considerably massive, I don't know. 20, 20 years, 25 years. Is that the time once they've got that in place, in your opinion? Um, 
it, it, it's a it's a possible, but I'm a little bit I'm a I'm a little bit cautious. And the reason why I say that is if you were planning to sell your house, you wouldn't go and put in a swimming pool six months before you sell it. So if I was Enoch and I was looking to sell, why go why go and pump in a hundred million pounds now if you're looking to sell it over the course of the next 12 months? So yeah, that, yeah. that does it yeah. because you don't see you no. know, invest investment takes years normally yeah. before it comes to fruition. Um so and also yeah, and also Joe, Joe Lewis and Daniel Levy are both Spurs fans. Now Joe Lewis and Daniel Levy want a legacy of not just building a magnificent stadium. And I can honestly say as an away fan, mm. I've, I've been to every stadium in the yeah. country, the same as you guys, uh, yeah. Yeah. and also supporting Brighton. I've done all four divisions because I've, 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 I haven't had any choice, which which you have had, you've not had to worry about. Yes. Spurs is the only one where I've got there and I thought, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Um, so, so they've done all of that. And, and, and that's great. But surely the the two main people at the club want to walk away with a few trophies themselves and say, we did it on our time, in our patch, using our yeah. strategy. Because if they if they sell over the course of the next 12 months and then Spurs in two or three years' time win the Premier League and win the win the Champions League, what's everybody going to say? Well, yeah. If, well, if, 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 if Levy and Enoch had sold five years ago, we'd have won them before. So yeah, th that's that's the that's the one reservation that I have um, because you know Joe Lewis doesn't need the money, Daniel Levy doesn't need the money from from the sale. What they yeah. do need is a legacy, and and you know as far as the legacy in the eyes of the fans are concerned, it's mm -hmm. what's in that trophy cabinet. Yep, yeah, and many people agree with that, Kieran. What we will do, we'll just go for our first break of the show for our listeners that are on audio. I must say, guys, we've had listen, hundreds of questions pouring in. We're just going to try and feed them in, obviously, to the relevant points and not take Kieran too far off track. But there's a good 600, 700 of you watching us live. So uh, thank you so much, as always, for your incredible support on a Sunday evening where, yet yeah, we're still in the midst of a, well, preseason is on its way very, very soon. And you know on last one, I suppose, we'll be covering that in full up to the start of the season and so much more to come your way. Um, only right, we'll go to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, Silent Dove Pictures says, what about the broadcasting revenues? Kieran, anything you can share on the broadcasting revenue side financially? Is that as strong as what it appears on the FFP side for Spurs? Um, well, there are three contributory factors as far as broadcast revenues are concerned, if, if we take the Premier League. First of all, half of the money is is given out evenly between all 20 clubs. Uh, the next element is linked to how popular the club is with broadcasters. Now, Spurs are popular with broadcasters. They're not as popular as Liverpool or Manchester United. So it works out about uh, it works out about one million pounds per each additional match. So, so you, you might be a little bit, you know, three or four million worse off. Not 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 significantly. The the third factor is where do you finish in the table? And in respect of that, it, it now works out as around about 2.3, 2.4 mil per place. So from going from, you know, seventh to fourth, uh, first of all, yeah, that's an extra 7.2 million worth of uh, Premier League money. But also going from fifth to fourth is the most rewarding uh, achievement in the Premier League. It, it's far more rewarding than actually winning it in terms of uh, qualifying for the Champions League. And you will get a minimum of 30 mil in the Champions League, even, even if you lost all your group games. Um, but, you know, each group game is worth around about 2.7 million euro. Um, you know, well worth having two and a half. So, yeah, that's why we saw Liverpool try to win every match, even in their groups, even when even when it was uh, gone, gone to dead rubber stage um, last season. So, so clubs are now sussing this out. That uh, you know, individual performances are important. Um, finishing top four was was certainly beneficial, but uh, what Spurs need to do is, you know, from a from a broadcaster's point of view, they they need to be challenging for the title because that means that their last eight matches will be, you will, you'll be guaranteed every single one of them will be shown by either you know BT or, or Sky because. It, it delivers in terms of eyeballs, and that's what broadcasters are looking for. Uh, it was it was exciting at the end of the season in terms of going for that final Champions League place, but 
you know, if, if you're going, if, if it's the difference between the Europa Conference and the Europa League, no, nobody gives a hoot. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Spot on. And just uh, reverting back, obviously, to where we are. So, I mean, Daniel Levy and his family, we know they own uh, 29.4% of Enoch International Limited, while Joe Lewis owns 70.6%. Uh, Spurs' is reported pre-tax losses of more than £80 million for the fiscal year ending 2021 was up from £67.7 million the previous year, whereas its net debt increased to more than £700 million. We know Inic loaned £637 million to support the new Tottenham Hotspur Stadium build, uh, which opened obviously in 2019 with a seating capacity still of, I think now it's just over uh, the 63,000 mark. It might be 64, 65 now since obviously we've done um, obviously continual builds and obviously putting more seats in the ground. Uh, we know the stadium, of course, is now hosting the lights of the NFL. We've got the boxing, we've got the rugby union events uh, and the new arena has now been permitted to raise revenue from both football and not non-football related events. Uh, this summer, we know global artists such as Lady Gaga, Guns N' Roses are also going to feature. So in your opinion, Kieran, is there a better time than now for this 150 million investment to go into the club, this injection of money? Well, um, you've always got to ask, what, what's the money going to be used for? And looking at the Spurs press release, um, it, it did appear that uh, part of the money was going for working capital in terms of funding over the summer. Uh, does this put the club in an advantageous position? If we take a look, um, you know, and, and Spurs have potentially looking to, to sign some players from overseas, what we are seeing as far as the European transfer markets are concerned is that a lot of clubs are skint. Now, normally, as far as transfers are going, you're paying in instalments. So if you're looking to sign somebody for 40 million quid, it might be uh, you know, four amounts of 10 million. You, you put down a deposit of 10 and then you normally play on the anniversary. If you've got spare cash, what you can do is that you can go to that selling club and say, look, yeah, I know things aren't great for you. How about you take 35 million now and we've got a deal? And everybody's happy. So th there is the capacity to, I think, to, to take advantage of that cash injection um and uh in in respect of that uh you know invest that as far as the uh the playing talent is concerned which which will be the main focus um the club is also looking to continue to invest in infrastructure um and that money's got to come from somewhere global interest rates are going up yeah we we, we know that yeah we, we've got record inflation and so on um so the ability of Spurs to borrow money at the cheap rates, which which they managed to negotiate in respect of the initial loans, which remember, all of this was done. I know it seems yeah, there was a world pre-COVID. There was a world in which Russia wasn't killing people in Ukraine. There, there was a world where we didn't have a lunatic uh, like Trump in, in, in the in the White House and so on. You know, the, the, world, the world was quite a quite a safe place sort of six or seven years ago when all of these negotiations were were taking place. Um, and, and it's and it's it's much more uncertain now. So it's it's more difficult to borrow at at, at cheaper uh, money rates um, than where we were. So therefore, having Enoch come in and say we're investing in the form of shares, and the advantage of shares is that there's no interest, there's no repayment date, and therefore the only way you're going to get the money back is ultimately you, you could pay dividends. I can't see that happening as far as Spurs are concerned, or you could sell either the club or you can do what manchester city have done manchester city sold 13 percent of the club to investors in china and they sold 10 percent of the club to investors in the us and they and uh uae you know shake man store still still carries carries the majority of and they've raised a huge amount of money from that mm. yeah that, that's that's lots of people loving the show i must just say lots of the love's pouring in for you, Kieran, and so much love for the show. And yeah. again, never fails to amaze me. Whenever we get this together, it's always fantastic. Go on, Lee. Sorry, mate. No, no, for sure. I, that, I was going to say, like, that, that's what fascinates me is that understanding the, the business side that just because 87.5% is owned by Enic, it doesn't mean to say that's going to be like that forever. And a, and a real easy way of raising money is to sell 10% of the club. You know, if, if Joe Lewis has got I can't. What did you, what did you just say there, Rick? Is what seventy percent of it? Did you say or uh, six, Joe Lewis? Seventy, 67%. yeah, seventy point six, seventy point six percent. Daniel Levy and his family twenty nine point. Yeah, 
if, if Uncle Joe fancied like just, you know, uh, raising more money for the club or, you know, putting more money into the club and selling 10% of his shares off or, or whatever, he could easily do that at a different price to what he's currently, what, what he bought them at or what he took the price. So he's, st he's still going to make his money on them 10% and still retain, you know, the, the, the majority shareholding, which I find, uh, again, uh, completely fascinating. Now, we've already talked about 100 million and we know that it's... Um, it's, it's in all them cash points now, all around the UK, ready to spit out. When they go to the cash points, they put their little thing in to start spending loads of money. Gen generally, Kieran, do you think that, that Tottenham fans, everybody watching and listening, should be excited now? You know, drawing down that money, that, that, that's an intent to go out into his transfer window, surely, isn't it? To go and spend, spend some serious money on some serious transfers. It, it gives the club the capacity to do that. Um, you know, the rest is down to the recruitment team working in conjunction with the head coach. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a Brighton fan. I, I think you've got the bargain of the summer in Eve Basuma. Um, How good is he? How good is he, Kieran? Um, well, I've been watching the club for 50 years, and okay, we've been crap for a lot of that, but we've still had some pretty decent players at, at times at the club. He is without doubt the most complete midfield player in terms of that 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 defensive role uh you know the likes of fernandinho the likes of kante um that that we have seen who have made such a difference and not not necessarily hollywood but he he his his ability to tackle is is ridiculous um his ability to to spot uh, an, an opening is really good as well i wouldn't say he's he's not the he's not the creative genius that uh, you, know, you yeah. might be looking for in terms of a number eight. But as, as far as, as that role, he's the person that picks up the ball from the back four the most frequently. He's the person that breaks up opposition counterattacks the most often. Um, you know, he, he, he leaves with, with our best wishes because the first season, uh, he, he was a bit, he, he was a bit nuts. He was a bit hit and miss as a player. There was always, there was always an error in his game, but under Graham Potter, that's, that's been addressed. Uh, I, I think for the for the money that you're paying for, and you know, he's in his last year of his contract, so so Spurs yeah. Spurs have got themselves uh, a bargain, and uh, I, I I want him to do really well because we love him to bits as well, and if he does well for Spurs, then you know we we we, we sort of take you know like all, all clubs, if you like if you like the player, you take pride in his subsequent career. So uh, yeah. I, I think you've got a fantastic acquisition there. Brilliant. Oh, Look, and more to come. More to come from this hundred million. That's what we want. Go get the uh, go get the cash points working. We want to spit them fifty quids out. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, obviously a very exciting times. It kind of brings me on. You know, you kind of mentioned him there in conjunction. Kieran, obviously, Spurs have made a couple of other signings so far this summer. Uh, it's funny because we're now nine days without a player, and it feels like Spurs Twitter's in the middle of a meltdown. Like we have signed three so far, and we've got to play in the last nine days, and suddenly the world's falling apart. But uh, that's the nature of a. Uh, I think Twitter and the social media and uh, all these transfer links. I mean, who, who shares these transfer links? I can't believe last one on Spurs would do such a thing. Absolutely horrendous. Who's doing these? Who's doing this thing to wind fans up? My God. Um, we do know, of course, that you said there, uh, Kieran, Eve Basuma, a deal which could eventually go up to 30 million plus. We've also signed Ivan Pedersic. Uh, so had the goalkeeper Fraser Forster as a backup to obviously Hugo Lloris. Um, we know Spurs are still potentially looking at two new centre backs if one currently departs a right wing back. Um, an attacking midfielder and a striker. So lots to still come. Um, in the 20 years, Kieran, of Vinic running the football club, does it feel like to you from an outsider and the times that we've had you on now, does it feel like they're really financially for the first time properly backing a manager substantially in a transfer market? Um, I would say that they, for the first time, with this equity investment, uh, and, and we have seen substantial investments uh, in in other clubs. Yeah, if, if we take Manchester City, if we, if we take Chelsea, we know that they're, they're owners of uh, independent wealth. I think this is the first time we have we have seen this in, in terms of Spurs senior management. Historically, they they have tried to to work on a break even or a profit basis. Um, you know, I, I think I said to you before we started the show that they can, if they wish, release the dogs, as it were. You know, and. Uh, they they also have to to impress the manager because you know, Antonio Conte is a high profile manager who will be attractive to other senior clubs in Europe if a he's he's paid enough money to keep him happy 
uh, which which I think he is. And yeah, we, we if, if he's not happy, uh, you've only got to look at the the uh, the settlement he he fought and fought uh, at Chelsea for. Uh, if, if he felt he was disrespected, then, then I think you the club can do that. The cash is in the bank. What what you don't want to do is to is to do an Everton. You, what you don't want to do is to get in bidding wars as as uh yeah, yeah Man- Manchester City have dodged quite a few bullets because mm-hmm. remember they 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 were bidding for Harry Maguire against yeah. Manchester United and Manchester United just outbid and outbid and outbid in terms of wages remember Sanchez go yeah you know, he had a choice of Manchester United and Manchester Crazy, City yeah. Sanchez, United yeah. outbid them there yeah. was talk about Ronaldo going to uh City last summer now yeah Ronaldo is is an exceptional He's an exceptional individual football player. He's not a team player. Um, and if, if you know, football football is now more science than it has ever been before, and, and therefore having all of the all of the pieces in that jigsaw linked up is is absolutely critical. And and, and you're probably not getting that with Cristiano Ronaldo as as, as magnificent uh, you know, as a goal scorer he is. Uh, you talk to United fans. Now and you must know United fans yourself from from nine or ten months ago. Yeah, you know, oh, we're going to win the Champions League. We're going to win the Premier League. More than fifty percent of them quite happy if we went elsewhere next season. So you know things can change. So what you don't want to do is remember remember the sale of Bale and what happened to all of that money very quickly. So seven. Seven. The, the magnificent seven, wasn't it? I think at yeah, the time. Yes. The, the yeah, Beatles. The, magnificent the Beatles. Seven. <laughs> it was. I mean, well, you, you mentioned uh, Kieran Man City there, uh, which is quite interesting. Given they've already strengthened their attack with uh, with Haaland, sixty three million. The we've we've heard that the financial package is worth I don't know half a half a million a week or five hundred grand a week, uh, which is ridiculous. They're about to sign or look likely to sign Calvin Phillips for again maybe a fee that some people were thinking 42, 45 million is a, is a bit cheap. They've done it again, but it looks like they're, they're going to bring that. That player uh, Phillips in to replace uh, who you mentioned earlier, Fernandinho. Uh, you look at Liverpool signed Darwin Nunes for a fee of eighty-five million. We also expect you mentioned them there. Manchester United to spend money. Chelsea have got to go and fix their problems. They've got major issues in defence. Uh, you know they've already let their, in, in my opinion, uh, one, one of the best defenders in the Premier League in terms of Rudy could go on a free. Uh, Christensen's gone on a free. Uh, Aspilicueta could go on a free. You know they, they've got some some issues to fix around there as well. Um, and obviously Arsenal starting to spend. Obviously you know they're, they're they're out of the Champions League, but don't worry, they, they've signed Gabriel Jesus, so uh, I'm sure it'd be fantastic for them. Um, but you know how realistic it is, is it financially and obviously on the pitch as well for Tottenham if we get the recruitment right? I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. Can Tottenham? challenge for the Premier League I mean uh, it, it, can we go with the world-class facilities the manager that we've got you see what we did last year if we can recruit correctly this summer can we challenge already this season for the Premier League well I, I know nothing about football yeah you know, I'm, I'm a spreadsheet dweeb so <laughs> can you put this in the spreadsheet I love the way did, did that was such a, such a politician <laughs> answer was it such a brilliant yeah. politician answer for Kieran um, well, well, what, I mean I, Liverpool I, 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 I think Spurs can go on. Yeah, there, there's there's a big big gap, uh, you know, on on the basis of what we saw last season. But remember, in in 2020-21, Manchester United were the runners up in the Premier League, and uh, you know Liverpool, I think, finished fourth. But, but yes, I, th- I think if we're honest, uh, Manchester City and Liverpool have set a standard mm. that yep. the other clubs have got to follow. Um, what they both have, in addition is that they don't just have a really good 11. Mm. They've, they've got two players for every position. And if you look at some of the sports science work that they do, and yeah, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, I, I teach at the University of Liverpool. Uh, you know, we, we get to hear, because uh, you know, I'm based in the Northwest, about what some of the sports scientists are up to and so on. They will be giving advice to, to the manager as to which, which players are not at 100% in terms of their ability. I think Spurs have got fantastic training facilities. And, and, that, and that, that again, it, it goes under the radar, but Daniel Levy does deserve some credit for that because I think what they need to be able to do is now to start to utilise that uh, that nature of uh, in investment in sports science, in 
uh, in 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 metrics. You know, we've got clubs that are using drones to watch their own players in training. They're all they're all wearing you know heart rate monitors. Yeah. They're all they're, ev everything is being monitored, and then it goes away to the nerds, um, and, and the nerds are able to report back, and that is taking place during the season. Um, and yeah, we, we did see some of the Liverpool players being rotated out of the first team. But what they what they were able to do last season is because they had, you know, they had Mane and Salah and Giotta and Firmino and, and, and so on, that they could they could do that. And it was, you know, two out of four or three out of four, and it worked. I think what you've got at Spurs, you've got probably the best two strikers in the Premier League. But what happens? A bit of loss of form, injury, suspension. What have you got so to, to back that up? And, and, and that's, uh, I think that's a challenge. A, because to recruit players of a similar calibre is very expensive. And secondly, keeping those players happy, because if they all, they all want to play, um, then, then I think it's a challenge. Yeah, it's got a great point. I mean, Kieran, we great also point. can't be, uh, listen, we, we, as much as Lee's right, we'd love to be sitting there challenging. We also can't forget the teams behind us, they're going to invest, they're going to spend money. And we've seen that in bucket loads as well recently. Uh, the Premier League, you know, as, as a league, the amount of money it generates and which allows clubs to show and flex their metals in the market. I think you're seeing that now a lot of teams out there, you know, that are behind us, they're spending money to try and see, can they be the team that break into the top six? Can they be, a, you know, a one-off like a Leicester? Um, and it, it's interesting because obviously I've, I've seen reports out that Newcastle United, you know, allegedly they could disguise permanent signings as initial loan arrivals in order to avoid the final fair, the, sorry, the financial fair play regulations being broken at St. James's Park. And we know Newcastle, we mentioned it on our last show with you, um, they became the richest club in world football when the Saudi Arabia based public investment fund completed a 305 million takeover last October. I asked you at the time, I'm going to ask you again, kind of eight or nine months on now, um, how long do you think it will realistically take before they are seen as a genuine contender for the league? Because at the moment, um, when you look at the signings they've made, I describe them as being really sensible signings. Nothing too chaotic or crazy or outlandish or, you know, anything of, the, of that kind yeah, of nature. Definitely. But they're just kind of, like I say signings that make sense in the moment. So what do you think long-term, Kieran? How long are they away from challenging the real top elite, the Liverpools, the cities, please God, the Tottenham's of this world? Financial fair play was designed to prevent any club from breaking into the top six uh, in, in the sense that, as I was saying earlier, you need to invest first and then you get the results later. Now, under financial fair play, you are restricted as to the amount of money that can be put into a club. Um, so I, th I think that will be, uh, that that will delay things. Uh, you know, in, in the case of Chelsea, Abramovich came in, Mourinho was in after one season, but the, the Chelsea wage bill just, just went from here to there. The signings were, were uh, incredible by Premier League standards. Newcastle can't do the same, um, and that means that they've, they've, they've got to get things right. So I think that you're absolutely right, Ricky. They are sensible signings because they realise that if they they don't want to... Again, I go back to Everton. They've seen what happens when you get it wrong, and last summer, Everton spent, what was it, 1, 1.9 million on Damari Gray in the transfer market? Yep. yep. Um, and and, and that's, that's the danger after you know, three or four years of big spending. Um, if, if you don't get it right, um, the Premier League's also tightened up the rules with regards to commercial income. Uh, that came straight through straight after the, the Newcastle takeover. That was That's going to make Newcastle's job harder. So I, I think Newcastle are going to find it a slog because you know, if you think about Manchester City, they had Rubinho on the wage bill for years. They had the likes of Joe uh, you know, and, and many, many other players. I mean, Joe, do you remember Joe? Yeah. I forgot about well, Joe. I, I remember City finding signing was it Adebayor, Wilfred Boney, and yeah, you know, they yeah. got you know Boney. they got yeah, and and they just sat they just sat in the reserves picking up 100, 120 grand a week, and and you can't, I can't I'm not gonna I've never criticised a player for doing that because nobody forces a club to offer yeah if somebody no. offers me 120 grand a week I'm gonna take it. And, and if yeah. I'm if I turn out to be crap because I am crap, then then I, I'll, I'll just I'll just wait, I'll just I'll just wait for my contract to expire. I'm, I'm never going to criticise the players for that. 
Hundred percent. That's interesting. I mean, you you look at things like um, uh, Scott Sinclair, didn't he? he? Went from Swansea, I think it was Swansea, wasn't it, to, to Man City. Yeah, that's right. Yep. You look at Danny Drinkwater, one one with Leicester, went to Chelsea, five year contract. Literally, I think he played eighty five minutes in five years or something ridiculous, uh, picking up hundred grand a week. So it, it does happen, uh, of course. And yeah, like you say, don't blame the players. It's the football clubs, that, and that's what that that regulations, financial regulations, should try and stop. That they can just you know, just throw money at people and just let them out. I mean, I remember I had a buy or he scored that famous goal, didn't he, against uh, against Arsenal and ran all the way down a pitch and all that sort of, you know, stuff. And you know, we obviously had him after that at our club and he scored a few goals to, uh, for, for us and for all the clubs he played at. He could have been world class if he fancied it. But anyway, we digress, we digress. Look, finally for me, Kieran, I want to ask, uh, um, when we had you on uh, about six months ago, and, and actually an article that you wrote at the start of the year, you quoted that Tottenham are potential big spenders of the up-and-coming windows uh, with a £400 million buffer on the financial fair play thanks to the consistent uh, or, or being so consistent or so frugal uh, in the market. Uh, finally, what do you think the future holds for the club under under this ownership? And do you think the naming rights stadium could be key part to whether they continue to invest um, where, where do you think we are, kind of from a summary perspective? I, I'd like to say uh, thank you and well done as well, because your prediction is is pretty much bang on. We yeah, invested yeah. in January. We're, yeah. we're looking like we're investing now. So financial fair play for us isn't isn't a major issue. But for you, where, how how well placed are we to kind of take that next step? Really, um, I, I think Spurs are in in the strongest place they have been in this century uh in in terms of wow. if if we take a look at the uh the capacity constraints at, at white hart lane and the fact that spurs are not as big from a commercial perspective in terms of global you know yeah you know, I, I can name three nfl teams or something like that uh if you go to, if you go to the states how many football teams can they they, they name yeah and it's oh it's it's manchester united it's liverpool it's chelsea uh, now that that's that's the challenge for Spurs. The only way that they can break into that, and notice I've not mentioned Manchester City, who have won the Premier League four seasons out of five. Yeah, that's mad. Yeah, which is a, an incredible achievement, and yeah. yet no, nobody gives them credit for it. Um, and and I, and I know that that money contributes to that. Nobody's denying that. Um, so I, I think Spurs are are in a position to uh, first of all. Take the cash and and spend it appropriately uh, in, in terms of the Enic investment to take the additional money that is, that, that is now being generated on on the back of having the magnificent stadium open, you know, for for 25, 26 home games a season to take advantage of the fact that it is a multifunction stadium. Um, and so so that there are there are lots of positives. Um, it's it now comes down to making the right decisions. Uh, yeah, you know, because people say, "Oh, we, you know, we've only signed Basuma for thirty million." Yeah, in, in my in my view, you you got him for, for if he had three years left on his contract, you'd be paying two or three times that. Yeah. So, I, I think million, you, you million pay, yeah. and and you bought him at the right time. He's still only twenty five, so you you could sell him if, if he's good. He he could go you know in two or three years to another club outside of the Premier League. I mean, I think we know what type of clubs we're talking about, and you'll make a nice profit. So I think there are there's some really uh, good long term decisions being made, but equally, it is very easy to mess it up in the transfer market. So build gradually, yeah. But build, but yeah, you know, the steps the steps are bigger than they would have been. Uh, have you not qualified for the Champions League? Are they going to be giant steps? No, I don't think they are. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and as you said, with Ndombele, you got you got your trousers pulled down in respect of that one, and you, you don't want that to happen. Do your due diligence, check, yeah. yeah, do do lots of background checks, and also sign players who will improve the team rather than just sign players, because yeah, United found that out with Ronaldo. Yeah, I, I got to say, Kieran, it's listen. It's fascinating as ever. It really, really is. I know we're coming to time because you're going live on TV very, very soon. We're going to end yeah. the show with just two questions, if you don't mind. Um, relating to Ndombele, actually, interesting point here from a great British Lawns 
care services his thoughts on a higher performance bonus to reduce the flops like Ndombele, where we provide a decent basic, and again, that's a reputed 50k a week. I'm sure it's more than that, then 15 to 25k a goal assist clean sheet. I mean, do you have any thoughts on the way that the, the bonus structure is at football clubs? Does that need to be looked into, in your opinion? Um, I, I'm, I'm quite fortunate because I I teach for organisations such as the uh, as the LMA and also teach football agents. And the, the noises that I get from there, have I gone all blurry? Um, a little bit noises, blurry. Yeah, I thought, um, the, the noises I get from there is, is that Spurs have one of the most incentivized pay structures in the whole of the Premier League. So it, it, it does help to de-risk things. Uh, in terms of you know, what happens if they do finish seventh one season and therefore only qualify for the the Europa Conference, um, you know, that's, uh, that, 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 that negativity is sort of built into the numbers. So uh, I, you, I think you're absolutely right. Football, football is a results game and uh, having a relatively low basic and big incentives for getting into the Champions League is, is certainly the way forwards. And it will work for a club of Spurs stature. The, tr the trouble with that, and I know you've got to go, buddy, but the, the trouble with that for me is when you've got other clubs that can go and shell out 300, 400 grand a week with no bonuses, you know, it's like put, put you again, like you did earlier with your the house analogy, put yourselves in that scenario. You've got exact, uh, uh, you know, a job, your dream job in front of you. One's paying, uh, you know, 15 grand plus, you know, 50 grand, you know, bonuses, and the other one's paying, you know, just a straight 200 grand. Which one? Which one are you going to take? And and that's the issue. So unless it becomes a reform, which I can't ever see, but unless it becomes a reform, like a salary cap or somebody where they say, right, well, you can only play, uh, you can only pay this amount, and then you can add on different bonuses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I can't see that that being flushed out completely. But for sure, Spurs have worked that over the last three, four, five years. They've worked that pretty well. I remember when Harry Kane burst onto the scene and in his contract value was absolutely um, loaded with goal bonuses and assist bonuses and all that sort of stuff because we couldn't pay him the 200 grand or whatever it was at the time a week that, that, that all the other clubs would have been paying. Yeah, and also what we are seeing increasingly as far as contract negotiations are concerned is because I think with the advent of uh, the... Sort of, yeah. I look at Manchester City, and, I, and, I, and this, this might probably ages me. I, I think of them a bit like the Borg in 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 uh, in Star Trek, in the sense mm. that everybody knows exactly they're, they're like a, a worker ants. Um, so what we are seeing at clubs like that is that the incentive schemes are very much geared towards team performances rather than individual performances. So yeah. provided you play a certain number of minutes, you will get this, that, and the other bonus. And, and that encourages players to pass rather than shoot, because otherwise you do have that dilemma. If I score, I get an extra 20 grand. Yeah, 20, okay, it's not a lot of money to a footballer. 20 grand is still 20 grand. Okay? It's still a good night out, isn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, definitely, 100%. <laughs> where, are you, where are you going? 20 grand can get you, uh, can get you far. Yeah. Final question, Kim, before we let you go. We know you've got to go live in a couple of minutes on an alternative platform. And thank you so much for all your time. It's been fascinating. Always brilliant to have you on. Um, Solid Dove Pictures drops in a question there and says, do you think they should introduce a law where there's a certain wage cap on football players? Do you think that can... Would you see that happening at all, Kieran, in the future? I, I, I think that's highly unlikely. And, and the reason why I say that was that, um, that the Premier League actually introduced... Um, something called STCC, short-term cost control, which was a wage cap uh, in around about 2015, 2016. And uh, that started to bite. Uh, yeah, and you actually heard managers of clubs saying, uh, we we can't sign players, we can't give them what they want because, because of this wage cap. Um, and, and it was start, it was really starting to, to, to become significant. And then the, the Premier League owners in 2019 scrapped it because they actually mm. realised that the you know, what, what we see as the benefits of a wage cap, which is to stop excess spending, um, they like excess spending. And, and yeah. if we're honest, so do we. Yeah, we, we all yeah. talk about sustainability. We all talk about, yeah, I want, I want the kid, the team to be there. I want the club to be there for my kids and my grandkids and so on. But let, let's not be hypocrites. Now, if, if somebody comes in and says, right, we're going to spend £500 million 
uh, this summer, you, you're not going to go, oh, well, well, I'm not concerned about, you know, I'm a bit, bit worried about the, the long-term cool impact. Sure. The cup. You're thinking Champions League final next season. I better go and book a hotel now. <laughs> Please, God, from your, from your mouth to God's ears, Kieran, from your mouth to God's ears. Honestly, it's been such a pleasure. Kieran, just um, for anybody out there that's listening to you the first time, and I can't believe they are, everyone must know who Kieran Maguire is. Kieran, where can everyone check out your content and the wonderful work you do? Um, well, I, I, do, I do a podcast with uh, stand-up comedian Kevin Day twice a week uh, where we look at the business side of the game. That's called The Price of Football. Uh, I'm, I'm Kieran Maguire on Twitter. I, I tend to talk about nothing but football finance, which... Uh, yeah, given that I'm a 60 year old teetotal colour blind bloke, makes me the most, most boring man in the country. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've written a book on football finance called The Price of Football. Um, that's that sold about 12,000 copies, which, given that it's a book on accounting, is, is ludicrous. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm around, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'm fortunate that I've, I talked to the Times and The Athletic and and you know. Uh, various TV and radio stations far too often, normally about Derby County. <laughs> yeah, I know. Alice, you've made we, your work out you... Derby. You've been superb, mate. Thank you so yeah. much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolute Honestly. pleasure. Thanks so much for the invite. Thank you so much, Kieran. We'll be touching base with you very soon. We're going to let Kieran go. I want to give you just a quick summary where we are transfer wire. So, Kieran, thank you so much for your time, my friend. We'll catch up with you very, very soon. The brilliant Kieran Maguire on last one Spurs. Thank you so much for your time, Kieran. Absolutely superb. What we will do is we will go for our final break of the show for our listeners that are on audio. Uh, from watching us on YouTube, there's still over 600 of you plus watching us live. And uh, we, listen, me and Lee are going to wing this now. Just a quick 20 minutes wrap up of where we are on this summer transfer window. And um, of course, it feels like these last eight or nine days, I don't know, Lee, it's a bit hysteria on, on, on Twitter and social media because Spurs haven't signed a player for nine days. But anymore, they signed yeah. three in the space of obviously, well, a couple of weeks, incredibly. Um, where do you stand at the moment on the transfer window? And yes, yeah, Spurs' is, well, reported target, which we'll, we'll touch upon in the next couple of minutes. I think it. I think it's frustrating that um, in a kind of perverse sort of way, we did the business on them free signings so early or relatively early um, that, that nine days has felt like an eternity. Like, I, I, even, you know, I know we all want, you know, I think... The expectations are that we're going to spend all this money that's coming in, but the war chest, the 150, you know, players going out. I think Kieran mentioned there about Champions League money. Uh, we've got 150 million in the pot, 60 million probably around Champions League, 100 million if we can get rid of some of them players. I mean, we've got we've got a massive amount of war chest. There's no financial fair play issue whatsoever. So what well, I think we're just expecting, you know, the money effectively, Rick, is burning a hole in, in us as fans, our pockets, and it's not even our money, but it's burning cut. Go sign this guy. Go sign that guy. But I think when you look at it from a from a calm head perspective, you know, three players in two two game changing players. I mean, no disrespect to Fraser Force. I think he's in, he'd be a brilliant backup goalkeeper for Hugo Lloris. But the other two are are actual class class signings for us already in the positions that we needed to strengthen. I think there's you know I don't think anyone we're under no illusion that we still need to strengthen probably four more positions. Um, and and I think that that's going on. I, I generally think that something's about to happen. You know, when you look at all of the credible journalists uh, that we follow on, on social media and that we've got links with, and you know, all the uh, credible people uh, that, that always get stuff right, uh, you know, throughout, throughout the different links, they're all feeling the same thing that something's about to happen. I mean, look, it doesn't take a genius to work out. You don't draw down 100 million, do you, um, if you're not going to go and spend it, right? So, exactly. What's there's, up, there's yeah, something the about to happen for sure. Yeah. What, what do you think, Rick? I mean, obviously it's only us two, and obviously yeah, yeah. You know, million, millions of viewers watching and listening, of course. But what, what's your take on it, Rick? Are you frustrated that we haven't signed anyone? Well, I think Since... we've got to be honest. When you when you look at Spurs in the previous what five, six, seven years, we've always been told it's a, a case of we have to sell before we can buy. You know, we've got to sell before yeah, we can buy. And exactly. this is the first exactly. window where you look at Tottenham, we've gone out and made three signings. Yes, obviously Fraser Force is a backup for Hugo Lloris, but Perisic and Basuma, they probably walk into Spurs' first 11. And I think oh, all 100%. of us said going, everyone's going into the summer, we've got to sign players that are going to make a difference for the first 11. And those two do. I think where Spurs at are right now is a case of they could try and do the players that they could early. And the rest of the targets, and we hope this preseason's coming. We know Conte's going to want to bring players in uh, before, obviously, the, the start of preseason because he likes to work with them. I just wonder whether they've got a bit more flexibility on the likes of Jed Spence because 
He has played in, obviously, England. He's played in a quite a demanding league in Forest. You know, does he come in and start every game? Possibly not. And therefore, is there a desperation to get him right now? Whereas towards the end of the window, as you know, Lee, Spurs will work on that fee. They'll probably look to bring it down as low as they possibly can. I know many people look at the fact that Daniel Levy has been working on that transfer. But what I would just quickly add on that, obviously, Paul O'Keefe, friend of the show, we know Paul very well. And Paul has said that the reason why Daniel is essentially working on that deal as opposed to Paratogies because uh, Daniel has got a family friend connection there with Jed Spence's yeah. representatives, which is pretty much key to this potential deal. And it gives Paratogy, I think, a good thing where he can focus on the other transfers, the likes of potentially Gavardio, who I know as a centre-back. Um, I know Ali's in his recent video. Ali, said he's, Ali loved him. Yeah, yeah he's Ali loves Obviously, him. He's, he's now apparently at the top of the list above Bastoni, who I think... Me and you, Lee, were both sold on him because uh, he was the Bastoni one that Conte before. wanted, right? He was the one yeah, that Conte yeah. wanted. But I think yeah, at the yeah, same sure. time, I think if you said to Spurs, what is their most imperative signings coming up next for Spurs fans? I think for me looking at it, I think we need to bring in an alternative striker. We have to look to bring in that alternative striker. And obviously... Um, is is Charleston for you the one? I mean... Uh, we, we have this debate, again, look, look, viewers and listeners, we have this debate so many times. It's, sometimes we come to the WhatsApp group, there's 500 yeah. messages in there, and you're like, yeah, oh, wow, mad. and you have to scroll through on the WhatsApp group you know, with, yeah. with the whole of the team of last one of Spurs. I mean, I have literally having this debate yesterday or this morning, I can't yeah. remember. But we were talking about, you know, is, is Richarlison the one? And Richarlison, for me, is to my own personal take. He feels a little bit like a Dharma Triway to me in the sense of, Hear me out, right? Not in the terms of ability before you start at me, but in yeah. a in in a, in the in a sense of he was so split. Adama Traore, do we get him? Do we not? Some of the fan base said yes. Some of the fan base said no, and it ran on for so long. In the end, the fan base were just like, "Yeah, do you know what? I'll take him." And and I feel uh, that's, like that for that's me, with personally, it's growing yeah, on me. It's great. Like the longer it goes on, it yeah, I agree. The longer it goes on, the longer you just think, "Oh, for God's sake!" Actually, he's really good. But because yeah. I, I was I was one of these guys in the camp that I was like. I don't think Richarlison is the right move for us. And the reason why is because people are going, oh, you know, he's a first child forward. He can play on the left, play on the right. He can play to his back to goals and number nine. But we need a genuine, this is just my personal opinion. We need a genuine number nine. We need somebody to come in and fight and challenge Kane. Because the problem with, if we only bring in Richarlison and oh, we can play there, Kane yeah. will still play every game. Kane will still play yeah. every minute. Kane will still yep. play 60, 61, 60, hopefully 67, whatever. But he'll, he'll play 60 plus games next year because generally you won't take Kane out as your focal yep. main striker to put Charles in there. See, Unless yep. you go and buy a, you know, another. That's just my opinion. But the long, as long as it's gone on, yep. I've started to think, well, actually, no, he's, you know, he can play him from the left and he's quite good and he's 10 goals and nine assists and actually he'll add to the team. But don't forget, we're losing Bergvine. So all he does, Richarlison coming in just replaces Bergvine, Danny Rick. See, I, I don't know, for me, the only thing about Richarlison is that I'm the same as you, Lee. It's growing on me, the actual yeah. move itself. And I think the reason why they would probably look to favour Richarlison over Rafina um, is purely, as I think Ali has said recently as well, that when you look at uh, what Richarlison can do in compared to Rafina, who's more of, like I say, a winger, Richarlison can also play a, a central lone striker role, which then means you have got cover for Kane. So not yeah. only are you filling the forward spots, the left or the right predominantly, he can also play through the middle. And I think the problem is if Spurs do sign Rafinha, they still need to go and get another striker. So with Richarlison, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone and you've got Harry Winks in yeah. there that obviously looks yeah. like he's going to move to Everton. So there's, you know, we know Prasty loves a, he loves a part exchange. He loves a transfer mm -hmm. swap. And I think the thing that only worries me a bit with Richarlison, and that is obviously it really is at the moment dividing the fan base for Richarlison. I understand why. I think my biggest concern is that wherever he's been, and please, guys, correct me in the comments if you feel I'm wrong here. For me, he's always been a starter wherever he's been. Coming to Tottenham, he's going to have to accept that he's not going to get in over Harry Kane, Hummin Son, uh, Dijan Kulisevsky. He's not going to get in over those three up top. So, therefore, my only worry is how does he feel being the alternative. I won't use the word backup because I think now we've been four competition. There's no such word as yeah. backup. But how no, does no, he I feel mean. being an alternative where after 60 minutes, he's coming off? How does he feel about that? Because Conte, to be fair, we have seen Conte fall out with Diego Costa, who, to be fair, Costa could fall out in a room with nobody. Let's be honest about yeah. it. But Richarlison is that character where I do like that needle in him because I think every player that, you know, are going to be successful, you do that little bit of devilment, like yeah. we saw with Deli Alley at the start yeah, of his yeah, right train. Yeah. So that's my worry about Richarlison, yeah, is how I, will he mentally deal with, with not you. playing every week? 
I, I, I agree with that. I, what, what I would say, though, is I think that Spurs have got, we and all of us, we're all guilty of this, including me, but but we're, we've got this kind of aura about us now that we can't replace Kane and we can't go and sign. Yeah. To, I mean, if, we, if, if these links were true, and they're probably not, so let's not get excited, but if Lorenzo Martinez, if we just go and put an 80 million euro bid down for them because they're not going to mm. sell any of their centre-backs anymore, yeah. so, for example, Bastoni, whatever, so actually we're going... Because they need money from somewhere, right? And if Scrignard don't go to PSG and they sell Martinez because they've got Lukaku, you know, all of that kind of kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Say we did, what are we saying? Because he, he's not going to come and sit on the bench, is he? So he, he, we're going to turn around to yeah, Martinez he, and go, you've got to fight for your place alongside Kane, alongside Son, just like Foden has to do with Sterling and Kane, Kevin De Bruyne mm. and Jesus. And, you know, just like, you know, Mane has to fight with Jota, just has to fight with, with um, uh, Diaz now, uh, Salah. Like, I, I think we've got this thing at Tottenham that we're, that, you know, no one's good enough to beat Kane and Son. And, and that, and I agree with that because they are, in my opinion, they are yeah, like well, literally at the top. They as are as the, the record book, as a record book saying, they're the best, obviously, duo be, in the Premier League. Exactly. But the thing is with Richarlison is he's probably got the confidence to say, "I agree." No, no, I have a go now. I, I no, back, no, myself. Yeah, I back myself. Yeah, I back myself. Agree. Totally myself agree. To do that. Whereas other players just like, "Oh no, I ain't going there because there's no there's no way that I can get in." So I think yeah. that's probably a positive with Richarlison. Uh, you know, Mark makes a good point early in the comments, and, and we are like this as well on the show. Most of the lads, oh, if not all of the lads, are like, Look, yeah. if 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 Conte wants, wants him, it. then it's good yeah. enough for us, and we want that. But obviously, we want to talk about some of the key, the key options. I think that it was a blow for me, per, not not personally, but like I, you know, looking at it personally with the whole Ericsson thing, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he's going to come home, and and he's not. I, he's definitely yeah. not coming home now, is he? So I, I still I can't see when I look at that. I I still can't understand that because you think you know he would let us obviously have flexibility to change formation he knows the football club um he knows the players which is obviously very key he knows the premier league it ticks okay. so many boxes so then I the fact that he was a playing thing rick i think it was a playing maybe he won't thing. yeah he wants yeah. to play every week and he for the he, world cup and but would he problem, play every week at man united only would he play every week at man united if he goes to man united he'll play every week at brentford he'll play every week at brentford I don't think he goes Man United. I, I don't know he if there's anything any reports out since we've run out. I, I think he's going to stay in Brentford. It's interesting. I think I think he's going to stay in Brentford. Yeah. I think, it's, I, I think it's interesting how we kind of distance ourselves relatively quickly. We were backing away like the Homer gif, like in the head, yeah, you know, yeah. when Homer backed away, like, oh, you know, it was good. Yeah. Because we must have got wind that actually, you know, we, we can't offer... And I don't think we should be able to offer any player a guaranteed place. No, that is a big absolutely not. That, that's that is, when as a that yeah, is. that's when as a club you're losing control. When you're saying to players you're going to start every week, and I agree with you, even with Kane and Son, they should not be starting every week. But I don't know if you feel the same as me that you know Ericsson, that looks like it's sailed now. But I still feel we had Lyle Thomason from Sky Sports obviously earlier in the week. Lyle feels that because of the commitments Spurs have made to their midfielders, Basuma, uh, Hoybier, Skip, Bentancur. We're unlikely to sign another midfielder. And that massively worries me because I think as good as those four options are, when you have got, you know, players coming, oh, teams coming to you that are going to set up, as we've seen often at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, giving us that respect of putting 11 men behind the ball, you've still got to need a player in there, that creator, that lock picker, that's going to break down a team. And I still think as good as those four options are, I don't think Spurs have got a player within those four that can play that eye of the needle ball through consistently no. enough, like I, an Ericsson. So I don't know if you I, agree with me. I still think we're going no, to need I, someone. We're going to need someone, I, right? I, I completely agree. But again, it comes back to that in Conte. We trust, you know, Conte must know what he's doing. If if Conte's spitting chips because we've let Ericsson sail down, um, you know, up, uh, up the uh, M1 or, or, you know, stay at Brentford, then, uh, you know, only time will tell. But, you know, it doesn't feel like, I mean, if that deal was there to be done, if Conte really wanted Ericsson and Ericsson yeah, would have, say, yeah. no, I'm not going to come because you're not going to guarantee me a position. Again, it doesn't feel like that's the that that would be a conversation either. Look, maybe I'm naive. Yeah. I just don't we, think that's the same. Yeah. Ericsson think, wasn't ever guaranteed a, a place when no. he was at, uh, at Tottenham in his pomp, let alone ga yeah. guarantee him a place now. I mean, he did play every week, don't get me wrong, but... Yeah, you know, I I do agree with that in principle. I think uh, the only other thing about the lock picker scenario is maybe we find one in that forward line rather than that midfield. I think if he's going to play a three four three, yeah, you don't get an Ericsson in that in that two. Ericsson no, doesn't no. play in a two anyway, so we'd yeah. have to change formation. And and Conte might have said, "I don't want to change formation. 
this is the way I'm going to win the league. I'm going to win the league by playing a 3-4-3. You know? and, he, and he's quite, and Lee, we saw last season, he's quite stubborn, isn't he, with that formation? He doesn't really change it that often. Like, we see he's quite consistent. You know, even with his even with his 11s last year, we look at his starting 11s, they don't really change much. You know, one or two at most, but generally it was quite consistent. You could kind of pick yeah. the team he was going to go every week. Just because we've had some, um, some comments come in. Uh, Great British Lawn's asking, and I'll be honest with you guys, uh, some of these names I'm not really familiar with, so I don't want to kind of mislead anyone in terms of the quality of these players. Uh, he asked, David Calabria, right wing back, Domenico Berardi. I've got to be honest and say to you that I haven't seen enough qu- enough, enough of these players to, be able to give you a judgment. I think, Leo, you're the same as me. I've always said I would prefer bringing in Premier League proven players that know the league, know what they're getting into. I've got some experience with working with Conte because now we're in that situation where we're heading into pre-season and therefore... You know, this is the time where Conte is going to absolutely blitz drill these guys. It's going to be back to the likes of the Pochettino preseason league. You remember when these guys were knackered? Yeah, it's a lot of running. It's a lot of high demand and intensive work. So I think now, you know, it's so important that Spurs are really homing in on the players in these next few weeks that are critical to bringing in early. And I think where we are, as we said earlier, and I said this with Jed Spence, I think Spurs will probably look at him and think, you know what, I don't know if he's going to start every week. And therefore, there is almost that, I think, personally, that that will drag. I can see that dragging. I know people are thinking, oh, yeah, because Daniel Levy is in control of the transfer. I think 20 million, I think that's what it's being asked for for a championship player who, don't get me wrong, played a pivotal part to get Forrest into the Premier League. Is that still a lot of money? I know you've got to pay an English premium, of course, because... I don't know. That's, that's, why, that's why I'm thinking there's still something going to happen at right wing back. I think that maybe the reason why they're taking so long on the Spence deal. And look, I, I've got no inside information on yeah. on, on the Spence deal whatsoever. But yeah. but other than what we've heard from, like you say, friend of the show, Paul O'Keefe and you know Ali Golden and, and everyone else that's reporting um, yeah. a, a, about Spence. But you, you you look at the sometimes you can kind of you can look, read quotes and you can hear what people are saying. You kind of put two and two together and you get five or sometimes you get two, you put two and two together and you get obviously the, right, the real answer from four. And, and I just wonder whether or not uh, Pratt is doing other, uh, other things. And Daniel yeah. Lee is looking at, like you said, with a personal friend and that sort of stuff. But, but actually it's because he's one for the future. He's homegrown. He's kind of not going to be our number one right back where, uh, right mm-hmm. wing back, sorry. So that that may indicate, well, hopefully it indicates that we're going to go yeah. out and get uh, somebody because we need. I've got, yeah, I've got a question. I've got a question for you. How, how do you feel next season? You know, Spurs they brought in Perisic for that left hand side with Sessegnon. We still got Regulon here. We probably expect Regulon is going to likely move on, whether that's going to be at the start or towards the end of the window. I think when I look at Spurs' squad, if they sign Spence, and I'm not doing the kid a disservice here when I say this, that when I've watched him. And again, I'll be honest with you, I've not watched him on a frequent basis. I've obviously tuned in and out of the championship. To me, he still looks quite raw. I think that step up to Premier League when you're playing the top elite level club and then Champions League as well. I think, I don't know. Are you you okay with that right-hand side of having Emerson Royale, Matt Doherty and Spence? Do you think that's strong enough? Because when I look at the other clubs, I still think that's the weaker on the right hand side of us, maybe, from Paris maybe. To Liverpool I, City. That's my only worry. I think rest of the squad, we're looking okay. If we get another attacking midfielder in, a lot picker, you know, I'm not too concerned. We do need left side centre back as well. I'm not sure I agree with you on that one. I, I I think Spence can actually step up. I think Spence can be, um, you know, like the Deli Ali did. I mean, don't forget, we we bought Deli Ali for five. Who can who forget it? Five million. Um, uh, only cost five mil, but he was from like two leagues down, wasn't he? Because he was in League One with MK Dons when he when we bought him, weren't in the Championship, and yeah. he come in and he was explosive. I think he played his first. I have to correct me if I'm wrong. I think he played his first game, made debut against Leicester, didn't he? Scored. Was it a diving header? I think at a back post yeah. or something. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. Goal and score or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and um, and he and he just went on from there. I just think it's all about. I think if we can get, if we can get. Jed Spence in, and he does that full Conte um, preseason. I think. I think anyone coming in. I think this is why we're we as Spurs fans are getting a little bit jittery because we know yeah. they fly out on July the 9th to uh, yeah. to South Korea, yeah. and that's what two weeks away basically. So, so we want, and we know that that's when that preseason really, really starts. We want them in the players. In, not we. We obviously want loads in. Cause go spend the money, spend the money. But Conte wants them all in, doesn't he? Before, before that day. So and that's clear, I don't know. Yeah. I think I think Jed Spence has got it in him. I, mean, I know. You know, obviously, uh, uh, one of our own, uh, Anthony Costa, loves him, and Frankie Major loves him. You know, from, from in the group as well. Like they've watched him a lot more. 
I don't know. I think he can step up, Rick. To be honest, and I, and I do and I do think that I, I I don't know. In my head, I've got Jed Spence and Doherty as our two right wing backs, and um, and with with Emerson Royal potentially moving on. That's what I've got with on the other side uh, Perisic and um, Sessignon. And then I, I I I think I think that's I think that could be very very potent next year. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think. The, the one thing that is obviously quite exciting is, and I want Spence to surprise me because, again, I'm not doing the kid a disservice. On the on the times I've seen him, he does look very raw. But we asked about a kid that, you know, let's be honest about it, Borough didn't fancy him, hence why they loaned him to Forest. And it just shows you how well that kid has done, that he stepped up, taken the club as part of the promotion push and got him into the Premier League. I do like to say, when I look at the other teams, if we're being genuinely serious, and I use that word competing for the Premier League, I think, again, I'll try and put this into context where City and Liverpool these teams are consistently getting 90 points. And, you know, for Spurs to get up towards that figure, you know, we've got to have an impeccable home record and we've got to really 100%. have an unbelievable way record as well. You know, we're going to have to go and get points against some of the big teams where, to be fair, under Conte when he came in, we did take points at Liverpool. We did take points off City. But ultimately, um, you know, we've got to hit the ground running. I think, as we've discussed on previous shows, the fixture list I think you look at it, starting away, starting at home to Southampton is nice. Chelsea, I've been surprised by their lack of business. They're going to lose Lukaku. They're going to need at least a striker. They lost Rudiger. They're going to need to cut the centre-backs from what we hear and what we understand. So, you know, they're going to, you know, that might be a good time to play them. That might be a good time to play them. But I think, like you said, I think everybody's fixated the case that we've got pre-season coming around very, very fast. We're going to Korea and all the noise is always out of Conte is that he likes all his players in before pre-season. But I think with Daniel and Spurs and the board, um, we know Spurs often do like to leave it late. So there maybe might have been a compromise there. They might have said, look, we can get you these yeah. ones in now, but these other couple of players, you might have to wait for them. And I think we are still in that situation where, Lee, I don't know if you agree, we still don't want to upset Conte. I know he's obviously I got us in the It's that eggshell league. thing, isn't it? I've still, yeah. You've still got that thing. I use the analogy in the season about, um, you know, your, like your wife or whatever. You've, 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 or, or you've, you've pulled a bloke or you've pulled a bird, but, you know, whichever it is for you. Yeah. Um, a, a woman or a man, I should say, like not, not the slang, sorry. So you've, put, you've pulled somebody and you're just, you know that they're well out of your league and you are just sitting there waiting, thinking, please, Please don't chuck don't me. Leave me. Please, yeah, please don't leave don't me. me. No, please don't leave me. You know, you, you can't go into a season like that. You can't, you know, he's here, he's, he's contracted. We're doing everything that he's wanted. You know, we're putting it out there. I think he, I think he, and he wants to win the league. Like I said it on the other show, didn't we, with a, a couple yeah, of shows ago. There's no, that's why we asked that question earlier. Like, believe you me, he, he really, really wants this league. So yeah. I, I think in his mind, he'd it, be sitting there going, I, I can get a 20 point swing out of that lot. I can. Liverpool did it a few seasons ago, as we talked about. But don't forget, Liverpool that that season when they signed they signed uh, Virgil Van Dijk in the January, and then in that summer they signed um, Fabinho and Nebi Keita and you know Regan, all that stuff, and that was a twenty two point swing. But don't forget, only last season, not not the season just happened, the season before, Liverpool yeah. only got sixty nine points. Yeah, the yeah. drop off from Liverpool they had a shocker, yeah. absolute shocker. They had like Virgil Van Dijk out when Everton, like when um, Pickford clouted him and he busted his leg or whatever he did, and they they had a shocking season. I mean, they, they, I think they finished third in the end or finished top mm. four, didn't they? But they, yeah. points total wise, so we are going to need other clubs to step up. So when when the likes of Arsenal strengthen him, we should be very happy with that because when Arsenal go and take points off a of City and points off a of Liverpool and mm. points off of Chelsea, they're doing us a favour. Don't, don't yeah. worry about that. So don't be threatened by that. Same with Newcastle, same with Villa, whatever. We just yeah. got to look after our own house. Simple no, as that. Got we, we got, we, we got a, like you say, fortress. If we if we can get that ground rocking, like we had it. Uh, yeah, again, like with the 10 yeah. flags, uh, Spurs song sheets, big shout out to them. And yeah. every all of the fans that there, all of us, all the viewers yeah. and listeners, we were in that stadium on that Arsenal game. It was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. The thing is, could, could you imagine that that like Arsenal that atmosphere for, for, yeah, for 19 games? We ain't going to lose there. Like, we, we, we are not losing lose. a home game. Million, million, yeah, million, we will not lose million. a home game if it's like that for 19 100%. games. I, I just wondered, completely. how important, finally, how important is that left side and centre-back role to you? Because, I mean, to be fair, listen, I think we laughed and joked all season about Ben Davis, right? And the thing is, he was so good there. Congratulations I, to Ben, by the way. He just got married. Yeah, Congratulations yeah, absolutely. Ben. Congratulations, congratulations to Ryan. Fantastic, yeah. uh, fantastic uh, pictures on their Instagram yeah, that people absolutely. were floating about. So yeah, yeah. Do you, I mean, how, how, um, if I was to say to you, almost like one to ten, how imperative is that for you to have a Bastoni or have a Gradiol or have a Pal Torres before the start 
of the season. Is that essential or do you think we can cope and wait towards the end of the window, bearing in mind how well Ben did for us there? Is that a priority area that we need to address right now before this pre-season is, hits? Yeah, this, this is no reflection on Ben whatsoever. This is not, this is not me saying that Ben's been rubbish because I think he's been absolutely outstanding and we could cope, but we don't want to cope. We don't want to make do. I, I would go as far as to say... The left centre back is is the big money signing that we need. Somebody yeah. just put in the comments there. Sorry, I forgot, uh, didn't see your name, but we need a marquee signing. I think it is the left centre back. I think if we go and get a Guardiola or uh, you know Bastoni or Pau Torres, I, I think that's I think that is a game changer. Look, like, in in my opinion, more than a than a marquee striker. And yeah. and the reason why I say that is because we've already got two world class forward players and somebody who we think on this show and certainly Frankie think uh, is going to be one of the best forward players in Europe over the next yeah. couple of seasons in Kulusevski. So I, I, I think the improvements in the side and it's really interesting to hear Kieran say earlier as a Brighton season to get older for what would he say 50 years? Yeah. Um, that, that Basuma is one of the best defensive tacklers, you know, all the stats that we've seen, everyone that we've we've read up on, he backed that up as somebody watches him week in, week out. I I, I just think that if we signed that left centre back, we would have three starting outstanding centre backs with two outstanding backup centre backs. I agree. Do, do you know yeah, what I mean? I agree. And, and I, I, I we've got, we've got so many games player. as well. We've got so many games what, coming what up. Do you think? We need that player, don't we? Yeah, I totally agree. I think it, I mean, I think as we've heard Ali say in recent videos as well, that um, I think Spurs are prepared to spend a significant portion of that transfer window, uh, sorry, that, that that budget on the left-sided centre-back. They're prepared to do that. So I think that's probably where they're looking to spend their most amount of money. And I wouldn't be surprised if the rest does go on a Richarlison type, because we said earlier, he has got the ability to play not only all across the front three, can play as the lone striker. Um, just on Roma's uh, Nico Zanilo, um, I must say, I think many have picked up on the fact that um, whilst he has got an incredible amount of talent, again, I don't watch the Italian league every week, he is quite injury prone. And again, I, it feels like mm -hmm. from what I've heard from other people, it would be like signing another Lamella, where again, a lot of time on the treatment table. I think the one thing that Spurs need, I know this has been a case that lots of clubs now are looking at this, is the durability of players. They need players to stay fit. You look at Liverpool last season, Marnie and Salah, how many games did they really miss? You know, if we can get a full season out of Romero, how much better are Spurs going to be? We, we, so lost, they, we lost 13 games without yeah. Romero last season. I mean, Mad. you think yeah. of where we could have been. And actually, did the, with, with the greatest respect, did that coincide with us winning the game, losing the game, winning the game, losing the game? That that well, weird period that we went through yeah. got absolutely yeah. ruined by Chelsea like three times. <laughs> Like disgusting, mm. like absolutely ruined by them. And I, I just, you're right, you know, to get that level of consistency. I thought Davidson Sanchez done really well at the back end of last season when, uh, you know, it came when, in when that, no, when that news broke, yeah. we, we were in the Beaver Town, weren't we? in the corner pin, you know, make sure you get yourselves down there, fantastic. But we're in the corner pin, that news broke that, um, that Cootie weren't going to be playing um, mm. for in the North London Derby. And we were like, oh, what? I mean, this was literally before we went yeah. in the stadium to watch the game. Sanchez thought it was mint. Sanchez against Burnley, I thought he was. Good. I thought he was good. You know, he, he he played well for the last few few games of, the, of that season. So, I, I think he's got a good backup there. We've got Tanganga that we've obviously talked about before that he can play across that back three. Um, people think, say you know, he's yeah. a bit rash, and John, but he's, he's and John Johnson well, as well. But, I think we should say this. John always says this to us. He, he's not going to go anywhere based on the homegrown quota, right? I mean, Spurs exactly. need you know, and they lose. Yeah. They're obviously, they're going to lose a player with winks. We have to add that they're going to lose a player with winks in terms of the homegrown quota. Um, I think probably be nice to finish up these summarise. How many more do you think Spurs need? Or what would you be satisfied with at the end of the window as we stand here on the, uh, well, towards the end of June and we've already got three in so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we need four. Um, so we've got, yeah, we've got three, haven't we? I, I think we need four. So I think we need a left centre back, a right wing back, a forward and a striker. Uh, and, and, and when I say forward, depending on how Conte is going to play, yeah. it's either that attacking midfielder, two number 10 scenario, like another number 10 type individual, like your lock picker you were talking about, Ericsson-y. But instead of him instead of him being like a number 10, maybe plays in from the left, mm. right? Because the way I see it is Bergwijn's going, so we yeah. need a replacement for... So Bergie is an understudy for like for Son like at yeah. the moment, even though he don't get a game. 
But no. so he goes, we still need an understudy for Son, right? We haven't got an understudy for Kane. And Lucas at the moment is the understudy for Kulisewski. That That's that's my simple brain. That's the way I think about it. So yeah. actually, when, when we're talking about, oh, yeah, let's get with Charleston in and throw Lucas in the other way. Well, to me, that doesn't make sense because we're buying we Bergie. Still need another, we need another yeah, forward. We're still going to need another, 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 another We're, we're selling Bergie. Yeah. We're getting with Charleston to replace Bergie, right? Mm. So so he comes in, great. But then we've thrown Lucas out of the way. So now we need to replace Lucas. Yeah. So, that, so that's why I'm saying I, still, I think we need a forward to replace Bergie. And I think we need a striker to generally challenge Kane. I don't want a backup striker, but you know, if that's what yeah. you want to call it. And I think we need left centre back and a right wing back. So I still think we need four. See, what I, do you I think? think yeah, I, I so for me, yeah, I think left side of centre back, they're gonna need to address that one hundred percent. As I said, I, for me, they need to go and still get a creative midfielder, um, an Ericsson type. You know, I think Luis Paqueta has been named at Leon. Again, I've seen clips of him, he looks great. Don't know much about the guy. Will he adapt the same way as Bruno Gamarish? I'm not sure. Bruno Gamarish has gone on, I think, to be one of the most exciting players in the Premier League now for Newcastle. Spurs need a similar type of player for me, although they've got four central midfielders in there. As I've said earlier, there's no one that's really that's a standout eye of the needle lock picker that's going to change that game where we're going to need to be playing the likes mm. of, I don't know, at home. I mean, we're going to be playing, dare I say, like a Brighton or, you know, the teams that right, you're going to have Brighton, are going to come yeah, in. Yeah, people are part of the bus. Yeah, yeah. A, Brent, a Brentford that maybe sit back and need to break them down. I can't say Burnley anymore because they're down now. It's weird. I can't say we've got to break down a team like Burnley. Not but, normally a Burnley or a Stoke. Yeah. I, I think, Lee, I think the reason why they might surprise you based on the signings that you want to make is I think what they'll do is, and I do believe this, that with Richarlison, um, I think they will go in for him. And I think they won't go for Rafina because they know Rafina, they've got to go and get another forward. So I think what they'll do is Richarlison, they'll get him, they'll send Winks the other way. Mm-hmm. And then Richarlison covers the two positions. He covers the lone striker for Kane and he covers also the forward line. They'll almost be like a two for one and Spurs will save on that. As much as that might upset people, that's what yeah. I can see them he doing. Plays, he, plays, he ends up playing two thirds of games when uh, when Son only plays, he plays two thirds of games and Kane mm. plays two thirds of games. Between yeah. the three of them, that's actually quite a lot of games. But maybe. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask Kieran actually earlier about the Barcelona situation because it's, it's yeah, still interesting with me how somebody can, a, a, a club can be so, so far in the red and in the debt that they're still signing the likes of Lewandowski and, you know, yeah. uh, obviously Rafinha. Now, we, we know from, from reports, clear reports, you know, the likes of um, you know the, the the key journalists that we got we got out there, Fabio being one of them, of course, um, mm-hmm. saying that um, Leeds and Barcelona uh, they've got personal terms sorted out with Rafinha with Barcelona, yeah. but they can't agree a fee because Barcelona yeah. can't pay anything. Uh, skip, now, if Barcelona go and yeah. sell De Jong, is it to Manchester United for eighty million euros, whatever it is? Mm-hmm. Does that then fund? Rafinha going well, want, to Barcelona. So, well, want, so well, it, Lewandowski also, his heart is set on there and he's not going to come cheap on wages as well, was he? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I thought I read a report was 35 million, but I saw today it's 52 million for Lewandowski. Yeah, knocked it back. But Apparently knocked it back. It's just, I mean, it's very, very, very difficult where, where they're getting their money from. And that's why, I mean, Rafinha, I really like him. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, he's, he's a right winger, right? Let's be brutally honest about it. He doesn't play down the middle and he doesn't no. play on the left. So he's he's ba- basically back up to Kulisevsky, or he takes Kulisevsky's place. That's it. That, that doesn't make sense that, to me. That signing is quality. Um, yeah, he's, an exci- he's an exciting player, but I don't know where that kind of fits in with. Uh, see, this is the thing. I think excitement-wise, I think he's more exciting than Richarlison. But Richarlison mm. makes sense logically because Richarlison fills two different positions. As much as that might upset people, if you look at the value for money on it. Richardson will cover you two positions. Rafinha yeah. can only cover you one. And well, I think and that'll be, I think be the games. difference. Looking at your yeah. angle, he also means gets more games because if he's covering yes. more positions, yeah. I mean, I did, I did listen to the wonderful Tim Vickery though, the other day on the national radio. Uh, we've had him on the show, a friend of the show, Tim Vickery, obviously South American football expert. Yeah. And he did say that the Brazilians are literally just focused on the World Cup. It is the biggest, biggest thing that they can think of. Putting on that, you know, the you know their famous kit and the camera panning down, you know, them being in the team. That's one of the reasons, the main reason why Jesus is going to, not why he turned us down or whatever, or PSG or anyone else, but he wants first team football. It's the same reason why he's gone to Arsenal because he guarantees he's their number one striker, right? And that's the same reason Ericsson won't go maybe won't come to us or we're not in for him or whatever because we can't guarantee him football. Same reason why bow has gone to Los Angeles. It's all about the World Cup. But that's yeah. what worries me about Richarlison and also Rafinha 
because we can't offer either of them in our side. Yeah, for, first you, regular you, football. First you team can't football. tell yeah. them, although they might be confident. Go, yeah, I'm going to get in that side. They're going to mm. have to displace Kulusevski in what? In twenty what? Uh, sorry, was it eight weeks? Nine weeks of football. He what assisted eight, scored five in the Premier League. Never, yeah. never even played it before. He's twenty two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kane. What else can you say about Kane? And Son just won the Golden Boot. I mean. Pff, you know, so, but, but maybe that's my idea. mindset. I'm too. Maybe yeah. I'm not thinking like a big club. Maybe it's just mm. go out and get the players and let them fight yeah. out. They've got five substitutions next year, haven't we? On the bench, yeah. um, loads of games to play. So let's just see. Let's let's see let's see what they do. But I think four. What, what do you think? Just in the end, how many do you think? Yeah, you think I, I would say well? I would say four as well. Four as well. I think yeah. for me, critical. If you're not going to get, I said to you earlier, if we're not getting Ericsson, which obviously looks now very unlikely. We've got to go and find ourselves another similar type of player that will break the lines, that will give us the opportunity to, as I said, open teams up. Because as much as I like uh, Benton Core, Hoy Bier, you know, I, I, I like the four. We've got the likes of Skippy, of course, and Basuma. I like those four. There is something missing still in those games where you just need it to be opened up. And listen, it's still early. I know people don't like me saying it. It's still early. Rick, somebody in the comments said, oh, uh, Chimbo and Dembele. I think <laughs> as much as I tried, I think Jason won that one. As well, the same way you won the Eric Dyer battle off me. I think, yeah, I think that's the end of the Well, I'm telling game. you, this geezer, this guy, he's the reason. <laughs> Don't even worry about that. He's the reason. He's going to play a lot of football for us next year. And look, you never know. You yeah. might see one of them four pushing up a little bit. We saw, do you remember that game? I can't remember which game it was when Skippy had a turn of pace that we all went, yeah, yeah. Left where the did that yeah, come yeah, from? Yeah, like, cut from? Maybe he's yeah. got a different plan where he can use these. Yeah. With a Basuma in the side, I, I personally think Basuma is probably your most defensive midfielder out of them four. I think mm. if you was going to rank them in terms of defensive, you know, at them four, I think Basuma probably sits, like like um, Kieran said earlier, like a Kante mm. type yeah. scenario. And 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 wins and churns and goes in transition. So maybe yeah. that frees up one of the others to push on a little bit more. And I'm not saying that Hoiberg don't at me. I'm not saying Hoiberg's a lot. Yeah, yeah. But when Hoiberg plays with Denmark, he plays a lot further up the pitch and does mm. influence a, a, a fair few more games. So yeah. Benton Kerr probably can do the same thing. You know, maybe Skippy pushes up a bit further with Basuma yeah. in there. It's interesting um, because, like I say, even on Ericsson there, you see that people, people feel we don't need a lot picker. It, it's interesting. There's so many different varies of opinions. I know people think Kane can drop back, but I think Conte has said that, and I think you've heard this as well, Lee, he wants Kane to just focus on scoring. He wants Kane to just be a number nine. doesn't want him to worry about yeah. dropping back. He wants him to affect the pitch in his most dangerous area, which is up top, and you look at his goal record. So, and I think he I think he wants to do that as well, doesn't he, to be fair. Like Kane himself, I see Shearer on telly. Obviously, mm. 77 goals behind uh, Alan Shearer. And yeah. Alan Shearer was on, uh, did an interview the other day and uh, he basically said if he if he wants it, he's going to have it. And I know that he really wants it. So he knows oh, yeah. that he wants to take that record. And yeah. you know, I think Kane's going to have to score, what, 20, 20 Premier League goals a season for the next few seasons, four seasons, to, to, to beat that record. And he, yeah. he, he'll want that. Um, dropping back in the number 10, he might get more assists, but is he still going to go and score 20 goals a season? I mean... The bloke scored 17 goals this year in the Premier League and he didn't even turn up until what like, first week in November. <laughs> yeah. just, the guy's it's goal mad. scoring is just it, incredible. So it is mad. You know, I mean, I, Craig on the screen there says, you know, Conte uses wing backs as lock pickers. Listen, maybe yeah, that's yeah. the way it'll go. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's true, the way it'll mate, go. True. Yeah, yeah true. maybe that's the way it'll go. I guess we'll see. I mean, listen, we'll be covering every aspect of it on last one on Spurs. We've got another transfer special coming your way this coming Wednesday. As we will keep on doing until the closure of this transfer window. We've got prison to cover. We've got lots of shows coming your way ahead of the start of the season where, again, we'll be back with you covering every minute of every game on Last Word on Spurs, from Premier League to Champions League, from Carabao Cup to FA Cup. If you win the lot, you'll be hearing every single show right here, as always, live and direct. From the brilliant Lee McQueen. Lee, thank you so much, as always, mate. Been a real pleasure, this one. Superb, mate. It's not often that we... It's just us two chatting for half an hour, is it? That's what, it's, it's actually been fantastic. So, Kieran was amazing. Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. Nice one, son. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for uh, for watching and obviously listening. And uh, yeah, get involved. It's going to hot up. I, I'm I'm certain. Not not that I've got any inside information, but I'm certain something's going to happen in the next forty eight hours. It's uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. But, isn't it? Again, you're you're right. I mean, they've just taken a chunk. They've just taken a chunk of money out. I mean, they're not going to do that just to sit there and do nothing with it. You know, the, the money's going to be there for a reason. And like. Lee's shirt says there, he's the reason. There'll be more he's the reasons to come, please, God, in the next few uh, few days. 
Oh, listen, we're all excited at the moment. Is it great just to be excited again about Spurs? We could listen very quickly. You have to say, you know, we, we go back 12 months ago. At this point, Spurs were trying to find someone to manage this football club. It's and we're joking. sitting here and we're moaning because after nine days, we've only made our third signing of the summer. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> ah, cool. I love it, mate. I love it. Now I think I think we go. I think we do well. And uh, look, I know that the thing is about the whole Arsenal thing. I put a tweet out about this. Look, fair fair play to him. I know people don't like it. Fair play to him. Gabriel Jesus for them is a really good signing for them. Do you know what I mean? For for them, he's another Lacazette. He, he's going to play every week. He's a he's a good signing for them. He, he doesn't make sense for Tottenham. No, no one can give not me an argument. Yeah, not for what we want. Yeah, not for what we want at the moment. I no, agree. Just, yeah, I agree. It doesn't make sense. And 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 for him as well, Rick. If he wants to play games, he's not going to come and sit on our bench when he can just stay at Man City and sit on their no. bench. Like, what, no, why not. would he do that? So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good good thing for them. They're just trying to create transfer window what rivalry. I've I've never heard this before. I, I see somebody said Arsenal winning the window, like. What is that a thing? Like, do you get a trophy? Well, they won, apparently, the they won the window, like, they won the window last. About? They won the window last season. They still finished below as a bottled fall. Well, so, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, again, so. we, we've. I think you've always said this, Lee. We've just got to focus on us. Do us, and you know we can be as strong as we want to be. And I think there's lots of excitement to come. Right? There's still, we, you know, the targets totally we're being linked with are much more high caliber than they've ever been. So, I'll mention that, guys. From the wonderful Lee McQueen, from me, we will see you next week, early next week. Keep tuned. Keep the eyeballs on Last Word on Spurs, as always. Please. Keep safe, keep well, and come on you